pai used to go to the drug stores or wherever there was a newsstand. And if I happened to be around with me, I had a little time on my hands, I would stand around that newsstand pretending I was looking at popular mechanics or something and watch the kids who would come in. Of course, at that time, kids would always come in where there was a big stack of comic books and just sit down on one stack and pick up comic books out of the next stack and read them or look to them. And I always hoped that I would see some kid buy a Walt Disney Comics or an Uncle Scrooge. I never did. They always picked up Superman or a Harvey comic or an Oswald Rabbit or something, but never did one of them even look at an Uncle Scrooge or a Donald Duck. I used to wonder, what on earth did they do with these big stacks of Walt Disney comics? They'd be two feet high sometimes. What on earth did they do with them? They tear off all that cover, all those covers and send all of those back. Is the company crazy? But evidently some kids were buying them always in the sly when I couldn't see them. about the great barks and the stuff that he wrote. It, it seems to me they're writing about someone else. I can't attach myself to that at all. <laughs> I, for a different person. Would you tell us what you feel your largest, and most important early influences, uh, especially in terms of artists, were? Well, it was reading the newspaper comic strips, and uh, I can go clear back as far as Winsor McKay is, as one of the influences. But uh, I would say that Barney Google and uh, Happy Hooligan and later on the Disney comics of Mickey Mouse were the influences. I liked the Mickey Mouse stories because they had humor in them. And uh, when you look at my later stories in the comic books, you'll see that I was kind of following the format that uh, Floyd Godfordson established of having Mickey and the other guys involved in funny situations at the same time they were having serious problems. And they solved their serious problems by funny means, some outrageous sort of thing that would happen. And I guess that, that is where I automatically formed the basis for my own story writing. And I know you had a lot of different careers. And... <laughs> I wouldn't call them careers. <laughs> I, I was a real misfit. I couldn't do anything good. Can you uh, tell us some of the things you did? Oh, I started out, uh, I wanted to be a cartoonist, of course, all of my life, from the time I was a kid. but. That required a little bit of training, and being a kid on a ranch up in eastern Oregon, I didn't have much opportunity to meet other cartoonists or learn anything, but I did do a lot of drawing on looking at the San Francisco Examiner and the other newspapers we would get that carried comic strips. But uh, I just automatically had to drift into farming, and driving a bunch of mules around a field behind a plow or a grain drill or something. It just wasn't anything that I liked. And from that, I finally saved up enough money to tell my dad that I wanted to go to San Francisco and see if I couldn't get into cartooning down there. So I went to San Francisco and I worked for a little over a year in a printing shop. Yeah, I had nothing to do with cartooning, but it was at least a living while I would go once in a while to one of the newspaper offices and show them some sample cartoons and 
get rejected and practically thrown out of the place. They had good cartoonists working for them in those days. They didn't have to take on some kid that didn't have any training. But I could read all those wonderful newspapers full of cartoons, and I learned a great deal while I was there in San Francisco. Then after I left there, I had to go back to the ranch again. And uh, from there, I drifted into logging, working in the logging woods. And from there, I drifted into uh, working for the railroad in the car shops on the riveting gang. I was there for about six and a half years on that lousy riveting gang. And in the meantime, I kept always trying to develop uh, cartooning. And uh, I realized that in order to sell cartoons, you have to have an idea behind them, a little bit of writing to go along with them. So I began developing the art of writing a little humor to go with my cartoons. So I got to selling gags to the Calgary Eye Opener. And that led to me getting a job back there as staff artist. And from that, it was just a step into the editor job as they gradually got less and less money through the Depression, and they couldn't hire any editors. It just developed on me to do it all. So from there, I got into Disney's by sending some samples to Disney's. And so my whole life was just devoted to trying one step after another toward becoming a cartoonist. What was it like to work at the Disney studio at this time? What was it like to work? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was a trepidatious period, I'll say. <laughs> Everybody was trembly and thinking they were going to get the ax at the end of the week. We uh, started out in the in-between department there on just tryouts. I got $20 a week. And when I got put on regular, at the end of the month's tryout, I got twenty-two fifty. <laughs> Believe me, that was well. It was pretty good wages for those days. It could pay the rent, mm. buy you something to eat, car fare, nickel car fare, go all over Los Angeles for a nickel. Well, naturally, I didn't like the in-betweens where I was working and was very eager to try out for these gags that they wanted for the story department. And like I say, I got into the story department on the strength of one of those gags. We were trying to think of things that uh, Donald could invent or that uh, he could get involved in. And uh, so I happened to come up with the thought of a barber chair that would uh, automatically clip somebody's hair, and Donald, being a precocious character, sort of messed up the machinery in it by trying to get his coin back. And I had no idea how the gag would be used. I just uh, created a situation which Donald got in this barber chair, and uh, he uh, messed up the machinery. It flipped him upside down and gave him a haircut on the wrong end. <laughs> and, <laughs> I uh, also included the little gag about the uh, shoe shine apparatus down at the where the feet would be, and that is where his beak was in this situation. So he got a shoe shine on his beak, and uh, when the gag was turned in, I had drawn it all in the sort of comic book for a strip way of drawing things, presenting the idea. Walt saw it and liked it. And Paid me $50 for the gag, suggested that I should be put in the story department. So that was the opening that got me in there, an upside-down barber chair. And then you, uh, th that cartoon, Modern Inventions, really developed out of that gag, right? I mean, that, you, you uh, Well, that was the gag that, that caused Walt and the others to think that they had, could get enough material to make them picture on that subject. It was the climactic gag of the thing. 
So it sort of worked backwards. You started with the end and, and then well, built the whole cartoon toward it. Well, on those stories that we did in for animation, we always tried to get a good, interesting, climactic situation and then find a reason for that situation. And that would be give us a beginning of a story and then we'd build up the gags all the way up to that big situation. It was a good way of making stories. It wor worked good in uh, writing for the comic books, too, to find a good, big, climactic gag, a very interesting situation, and then build everything up to that. You automatically write the story that way, automatically. <laughs> I was uh, ignorant about the whole thing. I didn't know what it would happen to me once I got in that studio. In fact, I didn't know that they had separate story departments and animation departments. I thought it was all just a, an informal thing in which a bunch of guys who could draw would gather around and figure out what they were going to draw and automatically come up with a little story of some kind and then just go ahead and work out the animation of it. So after I got in there, studio and saw that it was all broken down into categories. You were either an in-betweener or an assistant animator or an animator or a story man or a cameraman. You weren't anything else. You were just one of those things. And once you got in that bracket, you were there. How large a role do you feel you played in shaping Donald's character in the animated cartoons? In other words, what kind of control did you actually have there? Oh, I had no control other than just making suggestions or where I would uh, sit at my drawing board and sketch up the uh, business of some sequence of action. Why I was naturally adding a little to Donald's character because he was just a, an invention at that time and everybody that worked on him added something to him. I, some little new facet of his character, the way he was drawn or the way he would smile or yell or gesture, all those things were the result of a whole lot of guys working, the same as I was. Well, in the later cartoons, when they would give credits for people, you know, the different roles that people played, mm -hmm. they would say something like story by and give a name. Now. Is that the kind of role you ever played in the cartoons that is basically doing pretty much the whole story, whatever that means, uh, from beginning to end of the cartoons? No, I never was on a story in which I was the lone character. There, I don't believe there was any such a, a thing ever happened around there. There was always more than one guy on each story. Uh, a guy could think up a story idea. Homer Brightman was a great one for thinking up story ideas. Ralph Wright was another. They just think them up out of nowhere. And uh, once a story idea was presented to the other story men, why well, then a whole bunch of guys would work on it. Of course, there was usually two guys to a unit. They did most of the work, but they would call in these other fellows for conferences or to help them out. So I don't believe there was ever anything went out of there that was a one-man operation. What did you like the most and the least about animation? And that would lead to the question of why you finally decided to get out of it. <clears throat> well, if I could have started out right away as an animator, I believe I might have liked animation, but the fact that I would have to do a year or two years of in-betweening before I could ever be trusted to do any animation uh, sort of turned me off. I, I just felt it wasn't worth all that struggle. I always felt that I could do animation just, just thinking it out in my head, timing, timing the movements of the characters, the way they would set their expressions and things they would do. I thought I could do it. I believe I could, even at this late date. Knowing what I do about the problems of animation, I believe that I could have 
just started out with a bunch of paper and pencils and turned out something that would have looked pretty good. How did you that, get... That's a lot of ego. <laughs> sure. Do you think that animation uh, would be... Uh, in that, therefore, you think that animation is essentially no more difficult to do than a comic book, or maybe even easier? Oh, animation would be much more difficult. It's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done to move one character from point A to point B. In the comic book, you simply draw him here, he's at point A, and then one more drawing, and he's over at point B. It's so much simpler. You don't have all of that tedious stuff in between, and you move your things around so much faster. Your scenery, everything is, is all tied up in one drawing, for instance, uh, what the characters think, how they act, and, and how they're doing anything, what their problems are. It's all told in one little picture. In animation, you do a thousand pictures to tell that one thing. Yeah, even though I feel confident that I could do a small bit of animation and make it look all right, I know it would be very difficult. Do. do you have any remembrances of, of Walt Disney? Oh, sure. Yeah, Walt would come in on story conferences. He was <laughs> he <laughs> a, quite a comedian, that guy. That is, a good gag man, I mean. He, he wasn't a comedian in the sense of, of O.W.C. Fields or such a thing, but he could just talk gags. He wasn't one that laughed much at his own gags. He just think up a gag and tell it. Say that you should put such and such a gag up there on your storyboard. And always his stuff was good. Kimball, was big uh, help on story conferences. Yeah, Ward Kimball said that quite often people uh, in the story department would reach an impasse and Disney would walk in and just say, oh, you should do this and solve the problem. Is that your sense of his yeah, role? Yeah, that's like right. Uh, they were always hoping that he might drop in accidentally and <laughs> save them having to have a formal news conference. Did he have much control over the cartoons? In other words, did he did he determine uh, quite a bit what, what went into them in terms of continuity so that they all had a certain look and a certain style and a certain emphasis? Now we were supposed to work all that out without bothering him. He would just come in to say whether the story was good enough. And we had it put together. Now we were supposed to work all those minor problems out. Was there any attempt to have, to have a, like a Disney look or a Disney style? Well, I, I think that that Disney style just came out uh, without anybody consciously thinking about it. We, we all knew that uh, this stuff had to come up to a certain standard and the gags had to be of a certain type. And so everybody worked toward that one goal and they just automatically came out looking like Disney stuff. How did you get your start in comics? In comic books? Yeah. Well, I used to buy the comic books on the newsstands and I thought, oh, that's a field I would like to get into because I could write my own stories and draw them the way I saw fit, providing an editor was <laughs> the kind of a guy who would let me do it. And uh, so I was just uh, sort of pointing myself in that direction of doing comic books through the latter years that I was working at Disney's. I think along in the early 30s, 33, 34, and so on, the Superman comics and all those were beginning to appear on the newsstands. Well, I would buy those and read them and think that I could uh, probably invent characters and, and do that kind of stuff. You said earlier that uh, characters like Barney and Google uh, influenced your your art. Uh, were there any comic book, specifically comic book characters that were, or, or uh, comic book titles that influenced you? Well, I 
can't think of any comic books that influenced me. They, uh, they stimulated my interest, but they also made me think, well, I can do something different. That, uh, I saw the Superman stuff and all, and uh, there were some of the uh, comic books in those days that weren't Superman. They were about aviation heroes and so on that were more every day, and I really related to them more than I did the superhero. What did, you, what did you want to do that was different? Well, I wanted to uh, do like I did with the ducks, just create a real world and have them meet their problems with the everyday things, the everyday weapons that we have to do with uh, in our own lives. Four Color Nine, Pirate Gold, how did that come about, that you were chosen or whatever to do the... Well, uh, that Four Color Nine came from a story that Harry Reeves and Homer Brightman, I believe, were the crew that had worked up this story in which the, uh, what was it, Mickey or Donald? I can't remember whether they were working with Mickey on that to uh, hmm. go to the, dig for treasure hunt that treasure, and there was a parrot in that, and so on. Yeah, I think maybe it was a Mickey story they were doing. But anyway, the the whole basis was there for uh, a story for animation, and it followed this script, as you see it in the comic book, very closely, and it had been shelved, and so it happened that Oscar Lee Beck, I believe is the fellow who was from Western Publishing, was out there at the studio looking for material that could be adapted for comic books. And he saw that script in the storyboard form and thought that that would make a good duck story. So he just told, told him to go ahead and find somebody around the studio who could adapt that to comic book continuity and let him adapt it and then see if there was anybody in the studio who would draw it. So Bob Carp, who worked in the comic book department, the comic strip department, he uh, took the storyboards and uh, didn't take them home, he took photostats of them and from the photostats he, he developed that strip. And then Jack Hanna and I took the script that he wrote, it's all typewritten. We had to visualize everything from the typewritten script. Mm. And we went to, to work on it and drew it. So that was the start of the comic books. What kind of different problems did you, do you see in between doing a storyboard, like for Donald Animation, and doing a comic book story? There wasn't a great deal of difference other than that when you're doing a storyboard, you have to uh, do many more small changes of expressions and so on. You, you, that is, where there is one panel in a comic book that will tell something, there would have to be five drawings maybe on a storyboard to tell the same little thing. Because you have to give the animators a sort of a scene break. It's almost like every scene or every camera cut had to be shown on the storyboard. Well, one of the things you're most famous for is the creation of your characters, that whole family of uh, ducks that grew out of Donald and his nephews in the comic books. I guess that it was that I carried in my head the idea that there was a whole town and a whole family of characters all around these ducks at all times that I wasn't showing. There were cousins and nephews and nieces and, and villains and bankers and all kinds of people that they had dealings with in their everyday life that I didn't have to show in any of the stories that I had done. And so whenever I needed one, I would just create one that apparently had been around all the time, but just hadn't been used, and 
the way I presented them, they evidently was like it was in my head that they had been there all the time, but I just hadn't used them. Can you remember anything about uh, specific inspirations for characters like Scrooge, Gladstone, Gyro, Beagle Boys, and so well, on? Well, I think the reason for bringing in Gladstone was that I thought of this situation of Donald having to take a midwinter swim in a lake of ice cold water. And uh, it was a uh, something, I guess, from reading uh, of the uh, polar bear club up in San Francisco to go out the Golden Gate and swim around on New Year's Day and that sort of thing. And I just thought of Donald, how in the summertime he would get very rash and boast that he would go into the water in the wintertime. And so that's how Gladstone got into it. He had to be somebody that Donald was trying to outdo. How did you come up with the name? Do you know where you got the name from? Well, Gander and Gladstone, it's, it's a phonetic thing. You just what about Scrooge? And Donald Duck is phonetic, you know. Yeah. You wouldn't say Frank Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to Scrooge, can I ask uh, where the idea to, have, uh, to give Glad Gladstone his incredible uh, luck came from? Well, that came the second time I was using him. Mm -hmm. uh, I established him as a sort of an obnoxious character in that first story, and so the second time I used him, I thought of uh, what particular thing can make that guy lastingly obnoxious. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I thought of this lucky angle. He was the kind of a guy who who got all the breaks and poor old Donald never got anywhere. What about Scrooge, the most famous? Well, there it, again it was uh, the office, I think, wanted me to do a Christmas story. And so I uh, was casting around for Christmas stories. I began to think of the great Dickens Christmas story about Scrooge. And somehow, it, it is the classic of all Christmas stories. So I just was a thief enough to sort of steal some of the idea and uh, have a rich uncle for Donald. And uh, all the situations of the bear and Donald having to go to this cabin in the winter time to prove his bravery and so on. It just came out of the situation of bringing in a rich uncle. I guess it was the invention of the rich uncle that led to the reason for Donald having to go to the cabin because the rich uncle wanted Donald to prove how brave he was so that he, the rich uncle would have someone to whom he could leave all of his wealth. And Donald being a, a very <laughs> unworthy relative <laughs> had to prove he was worth it. The well, second time I used Scrooge was, I guess, in the story of the old castle. Well, he had turned out to be kind of an interesting character in that first story, and so I began thinking of uh, a way to use him again. And the old castle sort of established more of Scrooge's character. I guess the fact that he was rich was the thing that triggered all further developments is just how rich and uh, the showing of his wealth. And I found that that was quite a fascinating subject, just piles of money. It seemed to appeal to a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, I just gradually made him richer and richer, and then I had to develop a place where he could store the money. And, and all the time, the, there were the Beagle Boys trying to steal it from him. Those things just uh, grew like building brick walls. You just lay one brick on top of another, and finally you got a whole thing built. 
that's often said about Scrooge being the arch capitalist and so on. You don't quite agree with that, do you? Do because you? He, he doesn't spend his money. Right? Oh, he is a complete enemy of the capitalist system. <laughs> <laughs> he would destroy it in one year's time. There would no longer be any capitalism or free enterprise because he would freeze on to all the stuff that keeps capitalism going. It is the spending of money. The faster money is spent, the more prosperity everybody has. And Scrooge never spends anything, so everybody would progressively go poorer as he accumulated more of their money, and finally nobody would have any money but him, and he wouldn't spend any of it, so that would be the end <laughs> of capitalism. How did you ever get the idea of having him swim around then it and bury himself? Tunnel through it like a gopher and let it. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I don't know how I got on that good. idea, but it it just seemed like a ridiculous thing for him <laughs> to play with his money, physically play with it, and those were things that he could do with it to make a good picture in the comic book. We know when you stack up a few dollars and you touch them, they're hard. They don't yield or bounce around like water. You can't dive into a pile of money like you would into a snowdrift. So uh, he had to have a trick by which he did it. And I don't explain that trick because I don't understand it myself. <laughs> he can go out in the desert and he can smell the presence of gold. <laughs> Other prospectors would have to dig mountains of dirt before they could find any nuggets, but he can smell them. I think he represents something that nearly everybody wishes they could be some for some time in their life just a little bit too rich. Is this some fantasy that you had that you always wanted to be able to do this? Uh, no, it has no relation to my own life or my own desires in life. I I never had any desire to be rich, and uh, I always felt myself to be somewhat of an unlucky person, but. That's the only attachment I can say between me and Donald is that Donald was a victim of so many circumstances, but Donald was also making those circumstances against himself <laughs> by his own stupidity. <laughs> now, I, uh, I just created those characters out of whole cloth. They had nothing to do with my own psychology. Did you identify with one, one character more than another? Oh, I would identify more with Donald than I would with any of the others. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at Donald, he was everything. He was everybody. There isn't a person in the United States that couldn't identify with Donald because he's always been in situations in which nearly every person finds themselves in at different times. Mm -hmm. Makes the same mistakes that we all make. Do you find him the most interesting character? Mm, well, yes, I guess so, because he's most more interesting in more different situations. Now, Uncle Scrooge is very interesting in situations involving money and, and the finding of wealth and so on. He's more interesting than Donald could be, but Donald can spread over a whole bunch of situations. He can be a fireman or a sailor or anything, and he has to be interesting in all of it. How did you feel about the introduction of the nephews? Did it seem like a good idea? Well, I was against it at first. Mickey had three little nephews. I see he only has two nowadays. They destroyed one of them, I guess, to <laughs> save paper. But anyway, <laughs> he had three little nephews, and, and uh, when the suggestion came along that Donald should have three nephews. I thought, oh my God, here we're going to have all these little kids to draw and think up things for them. But I was working for wages, so I had to go along with the idea. And I happened to be in the story department and working on the duck stuff. So along came this idea to create some nephews for Donald. And so we developed the little guys. And it turned out they were a good idea. They didn't create, create a lot of trouble for us in making up those gags. 
who gave Donald a uh, good foil to work with. Whose idea was it to create the nephews? What's that? Who's Whose idea you? was it to create oh, the Oh, that was, uh, came out of the animation department, I think. Somebody over there, Joe Sabo or someone in the animation department, an in-betweener, just sent over a little note to the story department saying, why not have Donald have some nephews? At that time, they used to send out little uh, resumes from the story department to the animation department, asking for any kind of suggestions, any kind of ideas, or new stories, or in case there was a story in the works over at the story department, we would send an outline of that story to the animation department and ask anybody who could think up any kind of a situation that would be interesting or helpful to that story to turn it in. That's how I turned in that uh, barber chair gag, was on that same sort of thing. So that's how the nephews got invented. And then a guy named Dana Cody, who was working in the story department, he thought of the names for them. Huey, Louie, and Dewey names it would rhyme and had a phonetic quality. There's a reversal in roles between Donald and the nephews. In other words, Donald is supposed to be kind of a parental figure, but actually the nephews are the real parental figures, and Donald has to be taken care of a lot of the time. Uh, how did you come up with that, and why did you do it? Well, I think from the very start, Donald was the hapless comedian. Uh, anything that bad things that happened would have to happen to him. I couldn't have the little kids get squashed or kicked around. And uh, the kids can get themselves in some pretty bad messes through, oh, some, something they do wrong, and then Donald has a chance to rescue them. So I, I use that angle once in a while. But mostly it was Donald who was the guy who was going to get clobbered and the kids who were going to rescue him. It worked out better, and it seems as if it was appealed to more people that way. Mm -hmm. Because the readers were kids themselves. They liked to feel a little bit superior to that uncle who was strutting around. And that brings up another point. I think that one of the things that Oh, puts over stories in comic strips or anything is, can you make the reader feel superior to those characters? Like Donald, you, you feel superior to him. The reader automatically does because Donald is so bungly. And uh, when he goes strutting around, you just know way ahead of him that he's <laughs> gonna just get clobbered good. And when the kids get on uh, some binge in which they get into a hell of a problem, you feel superior to them because you know that, that they're going to have to think that solution out by very laborious methods. And uh, the only one of my characters that you couldn't feel superior to was Gladstone. He, he just was so darn lucky that the reader just hated him because he had to look up to Gladstone because of that one talent he had. Now, in newspaper strips, you follow that uh, gasoline alley. Have you noticed how many of those characters are sub-morons? The old guy with the donkey cart and uh, the guy with the funny cap and the girl chambermaid. All of them, they, they're just sub -morings. The reader automatically feels superior to those characters. It gives the reader a good feeling. I, th I think that that's one of the tricks of writing. I never thought about it until I was analyzing that gasoline alley one time, trying to think, well, why do I pick that thing up day after day and read it? I don't like those characters. I just despise them. <laughs> Yet I keep on reading about them. What about Jaro? How did he come about? Well, 
I think that every cartoonist that ever run anything in, in comic strips and newspapers always had a crazy inventor at some time in their strips. So I was in need of a crazy inventor. So I just deliberately invented Gyro as a crazy inventor, but I had only figured on using him once in a great while. So I just made him a big awkward looking chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I've known her. I was going to have to do a book of gyro stories and so on. I would have made him about the same size as Donald and Uncle Scrooge so that he could have been handled much easier. But he was this big, tall, gawky chicken. And <laughs> <laughs> very difficult to work him in the same panels with the ducks all the time. Uh, don't you like to make... Uh Pictures of inventions yourself, like Rube Goldberg machines. Did, that, did any of that oh, I, favor? I kind of liked it. I didn't mind it at all. I'm kind of an inventor at heart. I can yeah. think of all kinds of crazy inventions. <laughs> I would go broke if I ever tried to patent all the crazy things I think of. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give us any examples? <clears throat> oh, no. no. Okay. Because I, I still think I've got some good ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You created Duckburg. And one of the things about Duckburg was the fact that it had a history. Well, that came out of the fact that it gave me a little material to write about. And the founder would nat naturally have to be a member of the feathered family. <laughs> it was a good <laughs> <laughs> and then it gets back to the phonetics again. Cornelius Coot rhymes nicely. You wouldn't say George Coot. It doesn't sound very good. <laughs> and uh, the, the old mayor, naturally, he was just always pushing anything that he could about Cornelius Coot and, and the... Um, building up of the glamour of Duckburg because it sort of reflected back onto him. He got a little good out of it, a little exposure by always at being out promoting statues for the founder of Duckburg and so on. And, and the contests that Uncle Scrooge and the Maharaja got into, of course, became more and more ridiculous as time went on. And I don't blame this woman for writing a letter afterward saying that she thought that it was a gross misuse of money to build these enormous statues all crusted with diamonds when there was so many things that could have been done with that money, like building hospitals and schools and better jails, all that sort of thing. <laughs> 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 I... Uh, <coughs> wrote back to the office, I think I did, telling them that the woman missed the point entirely, that all that money that had been spent on those statues had just been spent for labor and materials. All that money had gone into circulation, much better than if it had continued lying in the Maharaja's money bin or in Uncle Scrooge's money bin. All that money had created a tremendous amount of work. Work for jewelers and work for goldsmiths and the concrete men and the hydraulics experts. Everybody had a job out of that. So that that money hadn't been wasted any more than if it had been used in the building of hospitals. Can you tell us how you came up with the Uncle Scrooge One story? Well, they uh, wrote a letter from the office and asked if I would do a Scrooge comic book, 32-page Scrooge, and I just thought, well, I, what little I had used Scrooge up to that time, he didn't have any uh, foundation, that is, nobody knew where he came from, although he had been Donald's uncle all these years, but what was his background? So I thought, well, I'll just work in the a little bit about his background, where he came from, and how he accumulated his wealth, and how he's out to protect it. 
I had already invented the Beagle Boys at that time. And, and so I just turned loose on everything I could think of that would help to develop Scrooge's character. Some of the characters or situations or whatever just came to you as a, as a kind of splash or inspiration, like the measles, right? Do you remember how those well, came about? That was uh, a story that did, like you say, come as a sort of a flash. I've been struggling for days trying to think of something that I could use for a long story plot. And uh, there was a whole bunch of company in the house at the time, and I never had time to really sit down and think of anything. And finally, I just got to the point where I just ignored the company, and I just sat by myself out on the lawn in the swing and, and did some serious thinking. And all of a sudden, while I was thinking, I got to thinking of the Everglades. And uh, what could Donald do in the Everglades? And what sort of creatures besides alligators would he find out in the Everglades? And, and uh, just like that, I thought of all these queer little people, like little gnomies that lived out in there. And as and, uh, soon as I thought of them, why ideas of how to use them just kept popping into my head. So I just sat there and let the Thoughts just pour all over me, and I remembered as many as I could. And when I had gotten enough that I knew I had a story, why, I joined the party and hoisted a few drinks. <laughs> Next day, I was hard at it, writing the measles story. Did you often start off with the, the idea of a locale to use as a story and build it around that? Yeah, the locale started me on more stories than anything else. Like I as I say about the measles, I thought of the Everglades. And uh, I told Don before that often when I would be struggling for a story, I would think, what locale do I want to draw? Do I want to draw a forest? Or do I want to draw the sea, the sailboat? Or would it be down in the mines, the caves, or something? So as soon as I think of uh, a locale I would enjoy drawing, it seemed that I could much easier think of a reason for putting those characters in that locale. What would they be doing there? And then uh, once I got an idea of why they were there, uh, pretty quick I would have a big situation gag going in my head. And when I got that going, why, like in King Solomon's mines, uh, get them down in the mines and then figure out what menaces have they got around them in the King Solomon's mind. They've got a gang of Arabs that are trying to get in there, too. And uh, so how did they get there? And that brings in the, the play of the nephews and how they help. All those things you just build backward from the big climactic situation, and pretty soon you've got the steps of a story. What about the creation of locales that didn't exist, like the land of the Perrys and Fermies or Plain Awful, those kinds of, uh, how, how did those stories evolve? Well, when you've got a mysterious place, uh, you uh, develop a, something that just out of whole cloth, like that. It's a mysterious place down under the earth. We don't know what's down under the crust. Scientists tell us it's a big molten core and all that, but Uncle Scrooge thought that there was a hole down under there, and he was going to be darn sure that he knew where that hole was. So once I got down to this mysterious hole, why, I peopled it with imaginary little characters. And in other uh, places, a square egg story. The friends. square egg story, well, that business of the fog, there was this guy had gotten lost in this impenetrable fog. Nobody ever knew what was over beyond that. I just used my imagination and got this place that I could go wild on anything like that. There's nobody to prove that I 
could be crazy about it. It was something that could exist and nobody would ever have known it. So on uh, the imaginary things, I went much wilder than I do on stories in which they are around familiar locales as, such as Egypt or Africa. Why do you think it is that that square edge story is the one that is usually mentioned as the one people remember the most? Well, when you analyze the structure of the story, you see that it was built on uh, little short sequence gags. Almost every page had a gag, or maybe two gags, which the characters moved through uh, a little bit of action to a short climax, and then switch to another little action, and another climax. It just stepped up and up. All, all of these little situations had to deal with moving them along the main story plot. You mentioned to me once that you started out with that story, but you didn't know how to end it, and you had a heck of a time trying to figure out how to end it. Well, whenever I come to a story that I had a heck of a time ending, I, I can remember quite a number of them. I would have to go back into it and change something back inside the story to give me a step toward an ending. We'd have to put some new business in. If the story just didn't end properly, why, it, it had something wrong with the steps that build up toward that end. Where did you get the idea of a square egg from? Oh, uh, having square eggs had been a joke for more years than I've been on Earth. I remember hearing people talk about getting chickens that would lay square eggs and so on from the time I was a little child. What about Bombi the Zombie? Oh, that was a story that came from reading about voodoo, I guess, and uh, zombies and so on. And when a guy's uh, writing stories year after year like I was, you've just got to be searching all the time for any subject that will make a story. So I, whenever I thought of something like a zombie or voodoos and so on, I would try to make a story out of it because it was interesting to a lot of people. And so I came up with you know, Bombi the Zombie. You, ma you made that character really sympathetic, so he never said a word and never well, really changed his expression. Well, uh, I was not writing for the horror comics, so I wasn't going to make him a ferocious, murderous sort of person. So I made him just a harmless old zombie who wandered around. He had just this one job that he had to do. <laughs> He'd been at it for 50 years. All of those things developed as I was writing along on the story. Of course, it took several days to develop all those egg situations and the, the ridiculous thing that this old guy had started out 50 years before with this little voodoo doll to give it to Uncle Scrooge and he never deviated from his course. He'd been at it all those years. <laughs> Do you know what, what you started out with first in that story? Did you start out with a character of a zombie or with a, with a situation? Well, I think it started out with Donald getting a voodoo curse. I mm -hmm. think that's the first thing. And then, then I figured, well, how does he get the curse? He has to get a hold of a voodoo doll. and get. He's got to squeeze a voodoo doll and get one of those poison needles in him. So how would he get it? And he just... So I began developing, and so I brought in old Bombi the zombie to give him the doll. And old Bombi, he turned out to be such an interesting character, I worked a lot of stuff in there for him, like his winning the, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> television, the television or radio program for intelligence. <laughs> in the trick-or-treat story, you actually adapted um, I, I guess a, uh, an animated cartoon or a yes. story from an animated cartoon. 
They were certainly there, photostats of the storyboard. Were there particular problems in doing that? No, 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 no terrible big problems. You added a lot to that. Well, I so did, and it got cut out. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about a story like The Golden Helmet? How did that one come about? Well, that too came about from uh, thinking of a situation in locale, close to Labrador. I believe I was looking at uh, one of the Prince Valiant scripts in which Prince Valiant had come to the coast of Labrador, and I was very much taken with one of the scenes where the, all the, I guess the Viking ship was coming into the coast there, and it was oh, a very dramatic drawing, and I was so inspired to work with that Labrador coastline that I just tried to think of something that would happen to Donald to bring him up there, and, and, uh, there it was, was the fact that Leif Erikson or some of those Norsemen had landed there hundreds of years ago, and they might have left some symbol of, of their occupancy of that country right there, some little thing that would have given them title to it. And so I thought of the golden helmet mm -hmm. and of a long descended relative of, of this Eric the Red or whoever he was, and wanting to find this one symbol which would give him the ownership of North America. Of course, it's stretching the law quite a bit, but <laughs> it was a situation that just developed out of wanting to draw the coast of Labrador. Yeah, most of the stories we've been talking about are, are fall into periods like um, the Square Egg story and the creation of Gladstone and Scrooge, and then uh, about a year or two later, the creation of the Beagle Boys and Gyro. Uh, it seems that there are sort of bursts of creativity where you're pr suddenly creating a lot of new characters and doing uh, even better stories than you usually do. And do you have any sense of like a situation or how you were feeling or any such thing uh, during these periods? I think that once I had developed a set of characters, like when I developed Scrooge and Gladstone, there were quite a few stories that I could use them in very readily without having to struggle too hard. So I would use them quite extensively. Then when they began to uh, be a little hard to write about, why, <laughs> I'd go in bed and invent some more. <laughs> A whole new stock for the stable. What about Old California? That's a story that you, uh, on occasion, when you've been forced to ask what your sentimental favorite is, you've, you've said, well, it's probably Old California. Why is that? Well, I was able to present uh, a little love story in that and also got in a great deal of nostalgia and a little history and uh, a little bit of villainy. And uh, that was the first pig bad guy, right? Don Porco de Lardo. Yeah, I was able to get some crazy names. You seem to really like uh, old relics and ghost towns and earlier earlier ages. And uh, what is there that you like about this kind of thing? Well, I don't know uh, how come, but I wrote so many stories about the far away and the long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it just seems as if. Uh, that was a subject in which I couldn't get into much trouble with. That is, uh, I could <laughs> do nearly anything with my characters in those kind of situations, and uh, it would be excusable. I've always wondered if you had a particular love for uh, an, um, the Old West or uh, an earlier time where people weren't as constricted by the city and by civilization. Oh, yes, I have a love for the Old West, the wide open spaces, all that stuff. I can remember when I myself was a young kid with plenty of room to roam around in with a gun to shoot and horses to ride, all those things that is a 
part of the formation of my character, I guess. I remember those things, you know, the niceness of having all kinds of room around you. Did you have any problems with censorship? Well, there, it's all pretty well known that I had censorship on that Klondike story and the Trick or Treat story and Milkman story, story of Donald's foot race with Daisy or some girl in the story of the golden apples. Yeah, the, uh, he, um, there was not much in the way of small censorship. But then I was so careful with my own censorship that I uh, didn't run into that problem much. It was just on the big things like the Klondike story that I got slapped with much censorship. You say that that you censored yourself. Could you tell us a little bit about what kinds of things you thought you should leave out? Is it things you might have wanted to put in? Well, I knew that I couldn't put in much in the way of violence. It had to be comical violence. It didn't seem to hurt anybody. And uh, Was this always true, or did it have anything to do with a comics code from the 50s? I don't know it was about the comic code, whether the, that kind of differentiation was ever made on violence or not. But I knew that I was not to glorify crime, stealing and so on, although I could have the Beagle Boys always stealing and so on. And the, but I did try to do it in a very comical way. So that it actually was not a crime that a child could imitate. It had to be, in my opinion, a crime that uh, was just in a world of fantasy. Kids could read about it, but they could not in any way ever imitate it. Disney's often noted for uh, not having any sexuality or anything, being very puritanical or pure. Did you, I know in some of the unpublished work that, that Goldie is, is much different than you'd expect from a comic book character. W did you ever want to put more of that kind of stuff in your stories? Uh, I've uh, thought at times that it could have gone a little bit more toward the teenage type of sexual interest, you know, kissing and hand-holding and that sort of thing, but I never thought of the comic books, especially of the ducks, as being sexy. Mm -hmm. I it just seemed to me like their interest was in other things rather than mm -hmm. sex. What about the problem of death? Sex and death go together, so... Well, uh, the characters had to be in danger of death in order to create suspense in a story. They, they had to be in real danger. And uh, when you figure that the very ultimate in danger is death, the fear of death itself, you just about have to use it. So all of the times these ducks got in bad situations, they did have that opportunity of dying in case <laughs> they got clobbered. So uh, it made it uh, more true to life to have them up against these impossible situations which they could lose their lives if they didn't win. Mm -hmm. And the vacation parade sequence where they buried themselves while the forest fire went over, you bet they were in danger. It made the story memorable. Yeah. Well, there does seem to be a kind of strain of, of pessimism and cynicism also in your stories. They're very funny, but there's uh, a kind of darkness at times. You wanna I, <laughs> I read some of my stories here recently, and I thought, how in the hell did I get away with that? <laughs> I had um, just a real raw cynicism in some of them. There was one that was reprinted here not long ago. It was so cynical, I thought... Which one? Was that the Cornelius Coop story? 
I believe it was. Yeah, oh, that. Oh that. man, that was full of cynicism. <laughs> Is that how you felt at the time about politicians or politics? Oh, it was. It, you know, there are bad politicians and there are good ones. I was just poking fun at the bad ones at that time. Sure. What about the mystery stories, like Ghost of the Grotto and Old Castle Secret, where there's um, um, an element of, uh, of the sort of horror story? Uh, well, there or? was a little bit of the horror story element in those, certainly. Uh, an old skeleton walled up in the walls of an old castle, yeah, that's almost in the EC Comics field. Yeah. But those things are interesting. And I managed to uh, put it over, I think, without having much morbidity about it. Mm -hmm. The crazy uh, <laughs> family tree that he had over there in the castle, all those old knights, these ancestors with their queer names. Carl, do you have any idea of why people like your comics? Well, uh, they seem to be interested because what I was writing about was a very real world. The characters were involved in things that they themselves get involved in. The people that write the letters have had situations just like old Donald has had. It's uh, so close to uh, real life. My uh, villains always had a slight good streak in them. Even the Beagle Boys once in a while show some sign of humanity. <laughs> And uh, my, vill uh, my good guys, they all had bad streaks. Donald could be a selfish, an arrogant little coot. <laughs> yeah, the, it was the fact that I, my characters were like human characters. They, uh, they weren't just one-dimensional. They, they had a whole lot to them. <clears throat> the fact that they were ducks rather than people, what did that have to do, do you think, with, with, uh, with uh, humanizing them? How did you, how were you able to do that? Oh, uh, I never thought of them as ducks. <laughs> For me, they were humans from the start. Mm. Yeah, I, I never thought of them as being ducks that lived in a world of animal people, of dog faces and so on. I, I just thought of them being humans. They just happened to be humans that looked like ducks. <laughs> I guess that's the only explanation I can think of for my attitude toward them. There's, there's one story in, uh, that's, that's uh, not typical of any of your other stories in which uh, Donald and the kids uh, confront human beings rather than other animals, as they usually do. Did you have any particular problems in, in working that out? It never occurred again, I don't think. Uh, if you're thinking of the story of dangerous disguise, yes. well, that was uh, a situation in which I somehow couldn't visualize all these master spies for all the different nations as being dog faces or pig faces. Somehow I visualized them as looking like they do in the movies. These suave looking characters and the beautiful girl spies and so on. They, to me, some, some way they just had to look like human beings. I couldn't, just couldn't see them any other way. So I went ahead and drew them like that. And I got called up on the carpet for it. Why, why did they like it? Oh, they said that. Donald and the ducks just didn't look right working alongside of human beings. And when I look back at the old Mickey strips and the others, I realized that always the other characters that were working with Mickey or the duck were always dog faces or pig faces. They never, never were humans. You mentioned once that that you always wanted to do a strip with humans, uh, a, a adventure strip or a romance strip. Can you tell us something about that? Well, my, my first love would have been to have drawn stuff for human characters, almost like 
Prince Valiant, you might say. That, of course, I could never have drawn that well, but that would have been the kind of thing I would have gone into and probably gone broke. I couldn't have sold my stuff, because I just uh, was a comedian, I guess, a writer of comedy. And whether I would have found a um, way of drawing human characters in a situation like I did with the ducks, of being comedians solving serious problems. Now, I, I might have been able to have invented a set of characters that would fit like that, be human characters, but I didn't have the time to work it out, and so I just stayed in the old duck rut, and <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Did you feel that, uh, well, from what I, I gather from what you, you're saying, that you yourself would rank something like Prince Valiant as, a, as more artistic or something than the kind of thing you did? Well, Prince Valiant was beautifully illustrated, and uh, each panel was a work of art. I don't think I could have ever have come up with that, because I didn't have the artistic background, the uh, learning, you might say, to draw that well. I would have had to have worked on something much simpler. I probably would have gotten into the field of Western stories, like the old Gene Autry's and so on, where the backgrounds could have been about simple things that I understood and knew about. In other words, you think Hal Foster could have done what you did? Well, I don't think that he would have worked very well with the ducks. That would have been a field that he wouldn't have uh, fitted into at all. He was more of an artist and a serious thinker. Well, why do you like adventure and, ro and ro romance uh, strips more than, than what, you, what you did? Why do, you, why, do, why do they appeal to you more? Well, uh, because they're different. After working on ducks for all those years, I'm just a little tired of that type of reading. I like to read something that is different. But you said you wanted to do it more than those. Was, was oh, that true that, at the that, beginning? That I wanted to do that type of thing yeah. more? Well, after working at this Disney studio and all those funny animals and seeing Bugs Bunny and so on, I, I would have liked to have gotten out of the right. funny animals field. And I like to draw humans. I like to draw faces and you'd rather figures. Do, yeah, that, you'd rather do that than yeah, I even found from it. the beginning? Yeah, I would have liked to have done that in the beginning. Do you think you could have made some kind of more serious statement yeah. in that in that medium than in the... Oh, I, the oh undoubtedly I could have uh, made more serious statements and gotten into philosophy and psychology, all those kind of things much more. Is that what you really wanted to do? No. No, <laughs> but I would have gotten into it accidentally. But, uh, well, you did anyway, of course. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, the... Human characters, I would have loved to have worked on them because I felt that I could take a, like a town like Duckburg, people with humans, I could have drawn a thousand different faces. So many of our artists that draw the characters, their girls all look alike. Their heroes all have the same profile, the same chin, everything. And it's almost as if they stamp their stuff out with a rubber stamp. And they have a certain set of frozen smiles and leers and sidelong glances. All of that stuff is, it's, you look at, at their strip one week and you look at it again the next week and it's just like it was all done with no imagination or no new interest at all. I would have drawn a thousand faces, as I say. I would have had every expression related directly to what was being said. I have read that in my fan letter, that my ducks always seemed to be thinking exactly what they were saying. Their expressions were always fitted right to that balloon of dialogue. Well, that's a really interesting issue that, that we were talking about earlier. The 
the relationship of, of the text to the image and how, in a way, the image entices the, a child to, to mm -hmm. want to read the words and see what's going on. Uh, was, yeah. that a, was that something you were consciously trying to do? Well, I tried to make the, the drawing fit the dialogue. The fact that I did my dialogue first always helped that along. Oh, you started, you started with, di with a, a script first, a written script or a dialogue? I started with a written script, and of course the dialogue is the key, that is the thing that hung it all together. Um, wh which do you think uh, is more important, the image or the text, or do you, do you think that one is more important than the other? Oh, uh, when you first open a comic book, the image is the thing. If you're, if you're attracted to the image, then you're interested enough to read the script. Therefore, the script would be secondary. What about, in, what about gagging? Do you, th do you think the same relationship holds there? Uh, in gagging, the, the visual gag is more important than the dialogue gag. In dialogue gag, you, you've got to depend on people's ability to read and to understand what uh, whole little idioms you're using. And it got to also figure on it being translated into foreign countries. So if you're leaning heavily on dialogue gags, why, well, it's a pretty flimsy prop. Some of the most spectacular things in your comics were the splash panels. Um, and it's very rare in funny animal comics to see anything like that. What, uh, can you tell us how you worked those up and how long they t some of them took you to draw, like the huge steam shovel battle and the, uh, the, the money dam exploding and uh, uh, so on? Well, the, the big <coughs> splash panel naturally was uh, at the height of some situation, the climax of some situation, maybe not of the whole story, but of the, of the build-up of sequences, like where the two steam shovels are, one's coming down the street this way and the other's coming the other way, and what happens when they meet, and I thought it was worthwhile to put it in a big panel where I could show all that machinery slashing at each other. You, you try to crowd that into too small a panel and you lose too much detail. And the, in those splash panels, there was a lot of detail. A lot of coins or a lot of uh, machinery or a lot of people or something that required lots of room in order to put it over. So the splash panel was, it was planned for well in advance. And uh, I just saved up all of these different things so that I had room to draw them finally in one big dramatic situation. Did you like drawing splash panels more than the smaller panels because you could do more with it? Well, I guess I did like to draw them. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put them in <laughs> <laughs> because it would take me two or three days to draw one of them. That uh, one of the... Uh, the square egg city. You know, when they, they first come out of the bottom of the fog and there they see this thing down there. Oh, I was laboring for about three days on the drawings of that. And then I got my perspective too forced so that the building came out diamond shaped down in the lower part. Were there any particular problems drawing splash panels that you might remember? Oh, <laughs> I'll say the problem was that they were so easy to cut out down at the office. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things I could put in a splash panel and tell a whole lot in that one panel. And then when it got down to the office, why they, if they needed to run an ad, they could look back at that, they could look at that page and say, well, we could cut out this whole half a page here and, and run something about air rifles or chewing gum. Do you feel it changed the, the nature of the stories and the way you developed them when you decided, as we know you did later, 
simply not to use splash panels. Did that, did that restrict certain things that you could do in comics? Nobody told me I couldn't use. I know you. You panels, just. But, uh, but when they cut them out, you decided that. Oh yeah, I. I got to the point where I thought, well, why bother to draw these big splash panels? Yeah, the, toward the last there, they were doing so much of this business of cutting out and inserting ads. It seems as if they had a bunch of advertising salesmen back in. Poughkeepsie, who were always out selling these pages to the different advertisers. And uh, I would do a story and send it in down here at the office, and maybe uh, Chase Craig and these guys would have the book all planned to go through with a 10-page story. And then here would come word out of Poughkeepsie, cut a page. We're going to have to run a chewing gum ad. So they have to go and cut a page out of one of my stories. And it got to be so prevalent, so much of it going on, that I, toward the last, I had a, a quaky feeling every time I wrote a story, and just wondering where they're going to be able to make a cut. It inhibited my thinking quite a bit. One time you, you said, maybe half joking, that you almost threw, put in some extra pages figuring that, 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 they do, that if they were going to cut something, they'd be these pages rather than something that you really wanted. I to. believe there was a time or two when I, I deliberately put in a page of just plain old padding. It could be lifted out and the two sections joined together and make a better story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that a time or two. When well, you're talking to Bob Clampett and Ward Kimball about uniformity, in the animation, they used model sheets so that everyone could draw the characters the same way. And around 1950, you did model sheets for the comic books. Yeah. And yet, all of a sudden, you were no longer doing, for example, the Donald Duck comic books. Do you have any idea why it was more possible for the animation to retain some kind of uniformity when, in fact, the comic books didn't? The, um, the animation, I guess, appears to be, like you say, there's more uniformity in the how all the guys draw the duck. It's because the, the director tells them exactly what they're to draw. And uh, there are certain poses that they cannot or will not put over in animation. They always have to uh, look good, in other words. And we were supposed to do that in the comic book. But I never did. I never followed the rules closely. If I had to show the bottom of Donald's beak, I did it. And uh, uh, as Don was saying earlier, that I uh, managed to make him look fairly good any pose that I found for the duck. That was just by using an eraser a great deal. I would just keep working on him until he did look respectable in any of those positions. But uh, one pose that apparently they don't like to do in animation or in the newspaper comic strips is the underside of Donald's beak, where he's got his head tilted back and you show the underside of his beak. It looks like a continuation of his neck. And it hides all the rest of his face. And so it is called an ugly pose, and uh, one that is to be scrupulously avoided. But I used it a time or two, and one was on the cover, on the magazine. A couple of them. A couple of them, yeah, that's right, in the... Uh, Scrooge one. Scrooge one, yeah, that was the underside of Don's beak. But I did show enough of Donald's face that you yeah. could see some expression. Sure could. Yeah. Sure could. Just... Yeah. Uh, straight on, the underside of the beak would be very uninteresting. <laughs> yeah, what about this question of if you think it would be possible to make three-dimensional models of your characters that, that would actually look like they look from panel to panel in your comics? Mm, and you, you indicated that you, were, you had to fool around with it, right? To make them look the best from any point of view. 
Well, I just had to draw the right characters in any situation in which the story required them to look a certain way. They, I had to work on them until they did look that way. Uh, whether they could have been uh, molded into a clay model and still look right in the poses I put them into, I don't know. And whether such a clay model could be manipulated so that you could turn the head and it would still look right or not. That, that is something I never got into, and uh, I never had any desire to, to make clay models of my character. It's one of the things that all of us who have followed your stuff um, notice, and it always surprises you, is that we can tell when, when, when your stories were done, by the way Donald is drawn. Could you talk a little bit about why you changed Donald? Uh, what, especially the, the, the famous change in, in 49, when 48 and 49, when he suddenly gets a longer beak for a couple of years, and then it shrinks rather rapidly. In fact, again, it sort of shrinks during one story in late 49. Well, I was very conscious of criticism from all the my readers or friends. Or I guess about that time there was somebody that had come out from the Disney studio and one of the women that lived up the road was an inker at Disney. And, and I think she was the first one that told me that the word is out all around the studio that you draw that beak too long. And so I started shortening the duck's beak. And then I got criticism from a letter, or no, it wouldn't have been a letter at that time. It would have been from some other person, either in the story department at Disney's or in the editorial office, that uh, I was making the beak too short. I was making the duck look too much like Al Talaferro's duck. And so I would make these changes to try to uh, please someone else, not that I had noticed anything wrong. And that other change in which I started making the duck quite tall, and the nephew quite tall, the head small in relation to the body and standing them up straighter, that too came from trying to uh, get a duck that looked a little bit more like the comic strip duck, the newspaper comic strip duck. Because uh, Somehow Al Talaferro always stood that duck up much straighter than I did. And he had a head that was smaller in proportion to his overall height. And uh, another thing that influenced me at that time was the paper, the drawing paper. The company got a whole bunch of it in from Germany that was coated with a kind of soft chalk. And whenever I would make my rough drawing, the pencil would make little trenches. And I've always drawn that duck too tall, always have. And with good paper, I would just erase it and redraw him again. And since there was a trench that was already made there on my pencil from making that tall duck, I would always getting my pen line stuck in that trench and drawing him that way anyway. So I thought, well, oh, heck with this. I'll just draw that duck the way he comes out in the first rough. Nobody likes it. Why, they better get me some better paper. <laughs> so they did. They, they got a couple of years' time, they got some better paper. Mm. Still from West Germany, but it was a better grade of paper. Did you ever try to introduce a moral in, into the stories. O often it seemed to me there was a moral. It was somewhat subtle. You didn't try to hit anybody over the head with it, but there seemed to be a point to a lot of your stories. Oh, Sometimes the moral was undercut, too. That come, that come in once in a while, uh, deliberately, and uh, often it would be something that developed as I was writing on the story. I would notice that uh, maybe I should just play up this angle a little bit. Yeah, I, uh, I would put them in once in a while, consciously, and other times they just slid in without any effort. Was there anything you were trying to say to 
to your audience in particular? Any, uh, any point you're trying to get across? <laughs> well, just to stop things like crime does not pay and pride goeth before a fall. Just right. the... What about a story that just occurred to me, like the $10 bill story, where there's a specific moral stated at the end, where the, Donald tries to return the $10 bill, and all of these horribly despicable characters come along, and, and finally he does get it back to the, by accident almost, to, to the rightful owner, and they walk, and Donald and his nephews walk off at the end with halos over their heads. And the moral at the end really seems to, be, to contradict the fact that if you if you try to be honest, which is what Donald's trying to do, you're just going to get destroyed. And yet, at the end, they say, "We'll know that it's always better to you know to be honest," and so on. And I that seemed to be one of those radical cases of where the stated moral is somehow in opposition to what the story is actually uh, proves. Well, I stuck that last line on there because I had. To felt that it needed something like that added to it, just to give it strength or to explain that strange ending that I put on there. In real life, Donald would have kept a $10 bill and <laughs> <laughs> spent it on himself. And <laughs> I'm kind of curious as to what some of your political views are, if you have any. I think that what I was trying to put over, if I did go into political things at any time, was that it's better to just have a free government like we have where everybody can do as they darn well please rather than to be locked up in Brutopia where <laughs> you have to obey a whole bunch of rulers. But I avoided politics mostly because it's a very uninteresting subject to young <laughs> kids and it's a subject that can get you into a lot of hot water. And my own political philosophy is that we got a pretty good thing where the way we've got it now, and we should just leave it damn well alone. <laughs> we can have water gates and all kinds of things, but nobody gets hurt, nobody gets destroyed, nobody goes to prison. We just have a lot of fun as we go along. Everybody's robbing everybody else, but <laughs> it's something you expect. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if, uh, oh, a thousand years from now, my stories were like Aesop's fables? They just keep right on going and never, that. never die. <laughs> that would be an ideal situation. I want to check up on that. Ha, 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 ha.